Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Here with Scott and Danielle today. And today's lesson for Sabbath school is God's covenants with us. But before we begin, Scott, who's the most important person? For Jesus. And the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit. So if you could lead us in prayer. Thank you. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of meeting um, together to study your word. Thank you for this lesson and for the important things it teaches us about you. Help us to hearken diligently to your voice and to um, always follow the indications of the Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit speak through us today. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. So, God's covenant with us. In Deuteronomy, the memory text is Deuteronomy 28, verses 1 and 2. Now it shall be, if you diligently obey the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments, which I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the other nations of the earth. All these blessings will come upon you and overtake you if you obey your Lord. God, or the Lord your God, sorry. When God makes a contract with us, us human beings that is, he calls that a covenant. We see that there are two types of covenants that God makes with people. The first and the most common is a bilateral covenant, where God says he will do something if we do something as well, or vice versa. The other is a unilateral covenant where God just says that he's going to do something regardless of whether we do something or not. God just does it. Very simple, right? There are six main covenants in the Bible, two unilateral and four bilateral, and they are as follows. The Adamic covenant, when Adam and Eve transgressed God's law and ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, death and sin entered the world. What was God's response? We have Genesis 3.15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. That he is a promise of a Savior to free them from death and sin, and ultimately destroy death and sin forever. That Savior is Jesus. The second covenant is the Noahic covenant. When the flood was over, God enters into a formal relationship or covenant with Noah and all living creatures that he would never again destroy the earth by flood. No matter how evil man would become, another unilateral covenant, God just does what he says unconditionally. So we have the Adamic and the Noahic covenants are the unilaterals. The third covenant is the Abrahamic covenant. God makes a covenant with Abraham and promises to make him into a great nation, also to give his descendants the promised land. It sounds like another unilateral government, right? Because he just says he's going to do it. But when we read Genesis 22, 18, And your seed, all the nations of the earth, shall be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. The bilateral covenant is a condition. If Abraham had not obeyed God's voice, all bets are off. So we look at the Mosaic Covenant, the fourth one. God gives the Ten Commandments, and all of Israel say that they will enter into that covenant agreement with God, saying that they will do all that he says. If they follow God's ways, blessings. If not, then curses, especially observing the seventh-day Sabbath, another bilateral covenant. The fifth covenant is the Davidic Covenant. God makes a covenant with David, and if he and his descendants remain faithful to God, he will make his name great and raise up a descendant from David's line whose kingdom will last forever. We know who that is, right? The Messiah, a bilateral covenant. Now, let me ask you, did David and his descendants always do the best? No, but it is God's grace that allows it, and he lets some things slide. Um... The sixth and final covenant, the new covenant, the last and final covenant of the Bible, the fulfillment of the Adamic covenant with Jesus Christ, the Messiah. We receive the ability to have our sins forgiven if we repent. We have the Holy Spirit as a guide 
to strengthen us if we abide and we are covered by Christ's righteousness and all has to do with choosing Jesus by faith and surrendering to his will. The final bilateral covenant. So why did God choose a covenant contract with us? Why didn't he pick something else? He is God after all. We are incapable of going to meet God where he is. So he has to come down to meet us where we are. And covenants were a common practice in business at that time when God, especially with Abraham, and God meets us where we are so that we can relate. It's kind of like with the Bible. Can we ever understand God? No. But he has men inspired. God breathed, literally write it so that other people can understand, so that we can as much as possible understand his ways. Um, does God always keep his end of the bargain and these covenants? Yes. But the question is, do we? No. And therein lies the problem. The last four covenants have conditions that we have to adhere to, those bilateral covenants. Lucky for us, God is a God of grace, love, mercy, and compassion. Even though we keep failing, he keeps trying to save us. We have six covenants but are they really that different? They are all pointing to God's grace to save us. And all by faith in Jesus, we have access to that. All show God's love for us, culminating in Jesus on the cross, the plan enacted after the first sin. And we see the bilateral covenants, we all have a choice. Ironic, isn't it? By freedom of choice, sin began. And by freedom of choice, we can choose to love God and walk in his ways. Our choice will either lead us to death eternal or to a loving God for all eternity. But one may say, it's too hard. It's just too hard to do. You know what? You'd be right. On my own, it's darn right impossible. As Christians, who is our example? Jesus. Did he ever sin? No. Did he ever lean on his own understanding? No. Did he ever trust in the arm of flesh? No, no, and all of the above. How did he do it then? By relying on his Father in heaven. But one may say, that was Jesus. It doesn't apply to me. He was special. And yet Jesus said in John 20, verse 17, this is after he's resurrected. He said to Mary, Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And then it hits you. The same Father that Jesus prayed to and communed with is our Father. The same God that Jesus is referring to is our God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus also said in John 14, 12, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to the Father. We have the Holy Spirit that ascended or descended after Pentecost, after Jesus ascended to heaven, that was the gift from heaven. We have a high priest in heaven petitioning for us who was tempted in all our ways. He can relate to us in every trial that we have. And we have the Holy Spirit here and now guiding, teaching, and protecting us. God will not save everyone. He wants to. He truly does. But he's not going to force anyone to go to heaven. We have to choose him. We have to live as he desires us to be. We have to trust in God and with our lives, even do what doesn't make sense at times. Only through God can we keep our part of the covenant. Hopefully we choose wisely in him who is steadfast and true. Danielle, can you tell us about Sunday? the Salvation Covenant.
I may have to rearrange my presentation. <laughs> um, as I was studying for this lesson, covenant, I mean, it's a heavy word even for us in this day. First of all, it's not heavily used. We don't use the word covenant, except when we study in the Bible, we run into it. But in our day-to-day -day activities, when we run into the word covenant, we don't use it. We use the word agreement, contract, things of that. You know, by definition, when you're looking at covenant, that's the definition. It's a formal written agreement or promise, usually under seal between two or more parties. In other words, bilateral, especially for the performance of some action. So in our day and age, that's really what a covenant is. It's a contract. But when we look at the Bible, in the Bible, we find the word covenant quite a few times. Like in the Old Testament, it's about 285 times. And quite a few times also, and if that's in the Hebrew, it's the word berith. And then we also find it quite a few times in the New Testament, in Greek, in diatheke. And in modern times, it just corresponds to a contract. But when it comes to the Bible, when to, to, to try to go between back and forth between the bilateral and the unilateral, we can simplify it. And as I was preparing for this lesson, it helps us a little bit to kind of wrap our minds around it. The covenant, we will term covenant in our presentation for Sunday, what's a contract. And salvation is a contract. And we'll see why in a minute. But other things that sometimes we look at as covenant are really promises from God. That's unilateral. God makes that promise to us. Like he made to Abraham that he's going to make it in a big nation. And that the Messiah would come through his line and so on and so forth from the Abraham's line. That was a promise. It's unilateral. God made that promise. And it wasn't dependent, so to speak, on something. I mean, maybe it was, but it wasn't spelled out. The yeah, they, it wasn't spelled out in the form of a contract. And then we have law. When God gave the law, uh, the law existed with God from the beginning, but he reiterated it to the Israelites at Sinai. And we know that it existed from the beginning because it's tied to his name. Um, in Psalms, it tells us that I, 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 I do your law. Uh, I hear your name and I do. I keep your law, and basically it means it's synonymous with God. It's His yeah. character, but He basically gave that law because it is part of who He is. It's like another unilateral thing. The law is unilateral. God gave it to us. We didn't have a say in whether it was going to come about or not. But when it comes to salvation, say salvation is a contract where God gives us the terms, he uses his law as is part of that contract, obeying the law, and then we are, we can accept or decline. So let's look at our text for Sunday. It's Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 to 14, and we can very clearly see, it says, and this is Jesus talking, uh, enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, in other words, to destruction. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. So obviously when we're reading this, it's a, we have to make a choice. There's a way, God's way or the other way. And the choice of salvation is to pick between those two. It's not, you know, the universalism view our lesson points that out and very clearly highlighted in this text is that the universalist view that everyone will be saved regardless of what they do is not true. There is some that will be go to perdition. And we've studied in the past, I mean, Revelation tells us there's a resurrection of life and the resurrection to damnation. There's two options to pick. So when we're, we looked already a little bit of promise and covenant, and we can see that those are unilateral, God working on one, one way. And then we're looking at this covenant of salvation. So what we want to really look at is what are the differences between promise and covenant laws we've already looked. But what we want to see is what are the characteristics of the contract, this contract or salvation covenant, salvation contract. 
First of all, it's mutuality. Uh, means both parties have joint duties and rights under the contract. And being obedient is part of our contract. We can see that in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10. For in G Hebrews says, chapter 8, verse, verse 10, For this is the covenant that will make that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And we can see in Revelation 14.10, uh, where he says, He himself shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of indignation. So that's obviously those that do not obey the covenant will be having the cup of indignation, and they shall be tormented. Uh, so it's mutuality. It's like obey. There's two parties that need to cooperate in this. Then it also is achievable. It means that the covenant's term can be fulfilled by both parties, and we know that God told us in his word that he will supply the capability to us. And when we do fall short, even though we choose him, he, Jesus will cover us with his blood. So that means it's achievable. Then it's conditional. It means that the contract is valid only if there is practical adherence. Anyone who believes and is faithful will be saved and will be blessed. Sin may hamper the receiving of some complementary blessings, like in this life, if we sin uh, in this world, like if we fall, we, there may be effects on us, but it doesn't change the basic blessing of salvation, which is eternal life. In other words, God will cover us if we come short, provided that we choose him and we repent. And the last characteristic is that it can be canceled. How can it be canceled is for those that have an option. We have a choice to make. Uh, we can believe in the Son of God. It, as it tells us in uh, John 5.13, it says, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. So what's the requirement? Believe in the name of the Son of God. Believe in this context means believe and act upon it because belief without action is not really true belief. And then what's the next step? If we, Matthew 10, 22, it says, and you'll be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. So endure to the end and you'll be saved. And then uh, continuing from there, we can see to the end in Second Peter chapter 1, verse 10 to 11. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You and I have a choice to make. We have to be diligent and make our election sure. We can choose yes, and we can choose no. I choose yes. I invite you to choose yes. And Christ says it won't be easy, but the reward far outweighs any trials you may go through. Absolutely. Scott, tell us about Monday to hearken diligently. All right, thank you. So I, I, I like that word, hearken. So it uh, takes us back to old English, you know, the when 1600s. they used to use words like hearken thou my words mm -hmm. and uh, in a fortnight I'll return. <laughs> so fortnight back then used to mean two weeks and a score was 20. So the word hearken in the dictionary, at least the online dictionary, it says uh, to give heed or attention to what is said, to listen. But I almost feel like it's it's a very strong word, so I'm picturing Darth Vader when he lifts up one of his soldiers by the scruff of his uniform and his feet are dangling three feet in the air and he's like speaking to him and I'm thinking that's one way of getting somebody's attention. So I feel like the word hearken is like somebody lifting you up by the scruff of your shirt three feet in the air and then speaking to you like be sure you listen to this. And then I was also thinking about the context in which this was done, which is Moses just had to spend 40 years in the desert waiting till 
all the people from the previous generation who did not hearken what God had to say, they all died off. So now he's telling the, gen the, the younger generation, hey, pay attention to what God said because otherwise it's not going to go so well for you. <clears throat> Your life just might depend on it. Your life does depend on it. So um, I was going to first of all read the verses from Deuteronomy 28, uh, but I found that Ellen White explained it very nicely in the book um, about the law repeated. This is chapter 42 in Patriarchs and Prophets. So I'm going to read some excerpts from there uh, to kind of give us some uh, context to this. So it says, The Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land, not as the land of Egypt from whence ye came out, where thou sowest the seed and waterest with thy foot, as the garden of herbs, but in the land, whether you go to possess it as a land of hills and a land of valleys, and drinketh water of the rain of heaven, a land of brooks, of water, of fountains and depths, of spring, of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley and vines and figs and pomegranates, and a land of olive oil and honey, a land where thou shalt eat bread without scarceness, and thou shalt not lack anything, a land whose Stones are iron, and out of whose hills thou mightest bring brass, a land which the Lord thy God careth for. The eyes of the Lord are always upon it from the bringing uh, of the year even unto the end of the year. Um, so th this is in contrast sort of reminding people that uh, that is the land that they could have possessed 40 years before. So um, Joshua and Caleb were the only two of the spies, though, who gave a report that was encouraging, saying, yes, there's giants in the land, but with God's help, you can conquer them. So um, the people, though, they didn't hearken unto Joshua and Moses and God. Instead, they hearkened unto the ten spies that brought an evil report, saying, the land eateth its inhabitants and their giants and you're never going to be able to conquer it. And then all the people got depressed and wanted to go back to Egypt. And then God's like, okay, if you don't want to go, then fine. All of you are just going to die in the desert. And they're like, no, we'll go, we'll go. But when they wanted to go, it uh, obviously uh, couldn't do it without God's help. So a bunch of them got killed and eventually they sort of settled into their fate. So now, Moses is like, don't make the same mistake as your fathers did. Uh, hearken unto my voice and unto the voice of God. Um, and now I wanted to read, um, this is a little bit shorter in the um, Patriarchs and Prophets than it is in the original because she sort of shortens the blessings. So I'll read you the blessings. If thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord to observe and to do all his commandments which I command thee this day. Blessed shalt thou be in the city, and blessed shalt thou be in the field, in the fruit of thy body, and in the fruit of the ground, in the fruit of the cattle. Blessed shall be um, thy basket and thy store. Blessed shalt thou be when thou comest in, and blessed shalt thou be when thou goest out. And the Lord shall cause thine enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. The Lord shall command the blessing upon thy storehouses and in all that thou uh, settlest unto thine, thine hand unto. Uh, however, there is a, a dark side to this, which is if they don't hearken, then bad things are going to happen to them. Um, and we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. I was trying to see what, if I missed anything from there. Um, so it says, um, so the, now this is the, the negative side, the, the downside if they don't hearken, but it shall come to pass if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe all his commandments and his statutes that I command you this day and all these curses shall come upon thee and thou shalt become an astonishment and a proverb and a byword among all the other nations. And the Lord shall scatter you among all people from one end of the earth even unto the other. And there thou shalt serve other gods which 
neither thou nor thy fathers have known, even of wood and stone. And among these nations thou shalt find no ease, neither shall the sole of thy foot have rest. But the Lord shall give thee a trembling of heart and a failing of eyes and a sorrow of mind, and thy life shall hang in doubt before thee, and thou shalt fear day and night, and none assurance of thy life. In the morning thou shalt say, Would God that it were even, and in the even thou shalt say, Would God that it were morning. Um, for the fear of thine heart, uh, wherewith thou shalt fear, and for the sight of thine eyes, uh, which thou shalt see. So, I'm going to stop there with the the negative so we don't get too depressed. But um, <laughs> that, there was a couple more points I wanted to make before we end the day, which is um, the Deuteronomy 30, 11 to 14, I thought was a good one to, um, to mention as well, which is th this is not impossible to do. This is, this is all within reach. It says, for the commandment which I command you this day is not too difficult, nor is it out of reach. It is not in heaven that thou shalt say, who will go up to heaven for us to get it, uh, to make us hear it that we may observe it. Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will cross the sea to get it for us and make us hear it that we may observe it. But the word is very near you, in your mouth and in your heart, that you may observe it. I think the other significance of this verse that I get out of it too is that you don't need to have a PhD, so therefore you don't necessarily need to listen to the voice of the so-called experts. Um, rather, God will directly speak to you through his word, and his word is not difficult to understand if you listen and obey and hearken to his voice. So with that, we'll move on to the next day. Thank you. Yeah, the plan of salvation is made fairly simple. It's not complicated. There are some deeper concepts and things like that, but as far as salvation goes, pretty much anybody can understand it. So let's move on to Tuesday. Honor the Lord. And it's kind of an odd day because it's not really a covenant here so much, but let's start off by reading um, Proverbs verses 1 through 10. And I'm going to break through sections of it. We're going to start off with 1 through 4. My son, do not forget my teaching, for let your heart keep my commandments for length of days and years of life, and peace they will add to you. Do not let kindness and truth leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart so you will find favor and good repute in the sight of God and man. Now, Scott, as you just said, that's pretty straightforward, right? There's no mysteries there. You know, keep, uh, keep um, truth around your neck and kindness. Write it on your heart so that it becomes part of your character and be, find favor in the sight of God and man. Now, others have a good reputation. Very simple, right? And Solomon is the wisest guy, so he, he can spell that one out easily. We go to verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Now we get into more of a bilateral conditional situation. Verses 5 and 6 Basically, say, don't trust in the arm of flesh, don't trust in man, but trust in God. Because God is the one who can make your path straight. God can smooth the paths. We can plan and all these things. I love the phrase, men plan and God laughs. Because what do we really know? He doesn't really laugh, but he's just how smart we think we are and yet we're not. And we see that in verses 5 and 6. And now we move on to verses 7 through 10. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your body and refreshment to your bones. Honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first of all your produce. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Now we start to get into 
a little bit of the, the grayer area. So why is God first? Why does he say he comes first? Well, I want to read Matthew 22, verses 37 and 38. And he said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. So if you truly love God, would you put him last? For example, if someone is selfish, who comes first? They do. So if you put God last, it shows his value in your mind and your very character. In the Garden of Eden, what was the occupation of Adam and Eve? We're going to read Genesis 1.26. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. That word rule is actually is more of a not like, not to lord it over them, but more of a caretaker, someone to, to look after them and take care of them. And Genesis 2.15 also is, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the guard, or into the Garden of Eden to go cultivate it and keep it. So God is taking care of the our garden that God, I mean that Adam is taking care of the garden that God planted. So what are Adam and Eve? What's their official position? They're stewards. But what does that mean? The biblical definition of a steward is an overseer or a manager of someone else's matters or goods. Simply put, you're in charge of taking care of someone else's stuff. We don't even own ourselves, and they don't own anything either, being stewards. God owns us. He created us. He redeemed us at the cross. And he's the only one who can give us everlasting life in an immortal body. Otherwise, we have death. Every day we wake up as a gift from God. So how much is that worth? Yeah, exactly. Everything. Because the moment you're not here anymore, what does it matter? All that other stuff. So if we put God first, then he knows where our hearts are with him. And he knows what our faith is like, a faith in action for him. Because James clearly states in James 2.20, but are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? True faith has an action that comes from it. And if we truly have that faith with God, that action would be to revere and to glorify him. He comes first. Um, and we see that that faith is necessary that we put God first as well. And if we love God, why do we love him? 1 John 4, 19 says, we love because he first loved us. Even our ability to love is a gift from him. So how could a true God-fearing Christian put him last? Or even in the middle I want to read Ellen White Counsels on Stewardship. In a subordinate sense, we should all have respect unto the recompense of the reward. But while we appreciate the promise of blessing, we should have perfect confidence in Jesus Christ, believing that he will do right and give us reward according as our works have been. The gift of God is eternal life, but Jesus would have us not so anxious concerning rewards as that we may do the will of God because it is right to do it, irrespective of all gain. In other words, God will take care of you. What are you so worried about all this stuff for? God will make sure that you're taken care of and he'll reward you where need be, but we shouldn't have our focus, our eyes set on stuff. We should have our eyes focused on Christ. Simply put, we honor the Lord because he is the God of all creation. He is the God of redemption. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And we are priceless in his eyes. We really have nothing 
but because of him, we are so much something. How could he not be first in everything? Danielle, can you tell us about Wednesday? First, before I tell you about Wednesday, I love the way you, you covered stewardship because it's a precursor to my lesson on Wednesday. So it's perfect. See, God does it it's so well. It's a segue. <laughs> uh, I mean, just like you summarized, really, Adam and Eve and us as inheriting from Adam and Eve and from God, we are stewards of everything. Yeah. So when he comes to us and he makes the tithe contract, which is the, the lesson for Wednesday, we think immediately, okay, it's a contract, it's a covenant, it is bilateral, means, so it's not a promise, and it's not a law given by God, but it is, it has a law in it, right? but it is an agreement with two parties, God and us. Um, as stewards, we have to return his tithe, and that is the, the, the subject of the tithing. And it, in the tithes and the offering covenant or agreement, God promises to give us strength to obtain material possessions. In return, he requires our faithful stewardship, faithfulness to the covenant, and to this agreement for three main reasons. So he wants us to pay tithe for three main reasons. Um, let's read, first of all, the first one, it's basically because material possessions should remind us, like the material possessions that he gives us, should remind us that God is fulfilling his part of the covenant. Our bringing of our gifts and ties to the Lord will serve as a lesson, training, reminder, and a continuous recognition on our part and acknowledgement that he, God, is the source of all we have and all we are. So it's that first continuous lesson and acknowledgement. And we see that spelled out in Deuteronomy 8.18, where it says, And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers, as it is this day. So he clearly tells us, but Beyond that, tithes and offerings show the mutual loyalty between God, who blesses his children, us being his children, who acknowledge, believe, and obey him, and the faithful use of our possessions. We cannot, we are stewards, we cannot use them as we'd like. He has guidelines for us on how we use our possessions. In turn, it reminds us of our mission in our salvation covenant with Christ that we through the blessing he poured out on us, will make his name known among all nations. And where is, tells us so? Here it goes in Malachi 3.12. There's other texts. There's quite a few texts that tell us that, but one very clear one is in Malachi 3.12 where it says, and all nations will call you blessed. It implies that all nations are watching us and mm. watching God interacting with us, and it's, all nations are calling us blessed, for you will be a delightful land. It's talking about material possessions, says the Lord of hosts. So it's talking to the Israelites and saying, I'm going to bless you. If you're going to return the tithes to me, I'm going to bless you. And all nations will call you blessed because they're going to see your land. Uh, whether I return. So number two, we saw number one. But number two is whether I return or withhold tithes, it's an indication of my spiritual condition with God. This fact becomes clear when we recall Israel's revival, revivals. And in our lesson, uh, and we also see it clearly in the times of apostasy. But one of the lessons that we, in our lessons that we had uh, was we were looking at good King Hezekiah and the times during his reign when there was truly a revival going on in Judah. And there was such a genuine revival and the people started faithfully returning their tithes and offerings to the temple. And so much came in that it was piled in heaps at the temple. So let's read together that story. It's a little bit lengthy, but it'll help us. So let's focus on this as we're reading. Here it is describing what's happening during King Hezekiah's. And in Second Chronicles chapter 31, verses 1 through 5. 
Now when all this was finished, all Israel who were present went out of the cities of Judah and broke the sacred pillars in pieces. So they're destroying the idols and cut down the wooden images and threw down the high places of the altar. So we could see there's a revival in going through the entire land, Judah, Benjamin, Ephraim, Manasseh, until they had utterly destroyed them all. So they're cleaning up land there based on the laws of God. And then I'm going to jump down to verse 4. And moreover, he commanded the people who dwelt in Jerusalem to contribute support for the priests and the Levites that they might devote themselves to the law of the Lord. They had fallen down on that, and they're cleaning up now. They're starting to bring back the things that God had told them to bring to the temple because the tithe was being used to support the work of the Lord. And as soon as the commandment, in verse 5, as soon as the commandment was circulated, the children of Israel brought in abundance the first fruits of grain and wine, oil and honey, and so on and so forth. They just brought tithe. And then we see in verses 20 through 21 of the same chapter. Thus his, Hezekiah did throughout all Judah, and he did what was good and right and true before the Lord God. And in every work that he began in the service of the house of the Lord, in the law and in the commandment, to seek his God, he did it with all his heart. So he prospered. And that's, we were looking at number two. What's happening, all the surrounding nations see the hand of God prospering them, and they see all the activity of what they're doing to reconnect with their God. It's the same with us. God blesses us when we are faithful to him in all aspects, including tithe, and he prospers us. But it is not only for our benefit. It is for the benefit of the surrounding nations. It speaks loudly to them. And those that are around us, our neighbors, our friends, they are encouraged to do the same. And the number three, being faithful in material possession is a way of honoring God. In Proverbs chapter 3, verses 1 through 10, it begins. And I'm going to skip, just read the beginning and skip down. So in the beginning of Proverbs 3, verses 1 to 10, we can see who it's addressed to. My son, do not forget my laws, but let your heart keep my commandments for length of days and long life and peaceful day will add to you. And it continues to show all these blessings that will happen if we obey God. And then it jumping down to verse 9 in the same chapter. Verse 9 says, Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruit of all your increase, so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. So we continued on that thought. But one of the verses in our lesson today is Malachi chapter 3, verses 7 to 11. And it is, this was written by prophet Malachi, and it was a message given by God to the prophet during a time of apostasy of the Israelites. So it is a call back to come back and re-honor the Lord. And it says, I'm going to read it very fast and then I'm going to summarize some of the concepts. Yet from the days of your fathers, you have gone away from my ordinances and you have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you said, in what way shall we return? Do not rob God. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me. Even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now. This is God asking us to take in this agreement to try him out, to, to take him at his word. And the Lord of hosts promises... Uh, if, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will be not be room enough to receive it and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. In other words, he's going to protect them from any, protect them even so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. So we can see the negative of what's happening in the land and what the Lord is promising if we obey him. I'd like to quickly just unpack a little bit uh, just some of the words in this um, text. Will a man rob God? It's strong language indeed. I mean, Malachi is showing specifically the way the people have robbed the God by withholding tithes and offerings. And then there's a curse. It says, ye are cursed. There's obviously a curse automatically following disobedience and a blessing following obedience. 
And all the ties, the concept is that if they brought sometimes they didn't bring the complete ties, all that was due God. So we are asked to bring all that is good due God. And then God will open the windows of heaven. Now the words windows of heaven were used in the Bible in Noah's time when God opened the windows of heaven to bring out the rains on uh, the earth and then to close at the end of the flood the window of heaven. Well, God is using the same language to show not the flood, but to show the flood of blessing that would come, that he would open on us. I mean, beautiful, uh, powerful wording. That's really the invitation to us. We are to obey our Lord and to give him what is due him. And there will be blessings, and the blessings will be such that we will be a sight for the nations to see. And I like that. Before we move to Scott, when you are a thief, you steal something secretly. Mm -hmm. When you rob somebody, it's, it's up close and personal. Daylight. Yeah. So, Scott, can you tell us about Seek Ye First? We know the yes. rest of it, the kingdom of God, but I don't want to steal your thunder. Seek Ye First. So, I think this, uh, this piggybacks onto what <clears throat> Danielle was saying in that I think with the tithe, you're giving God his portion first, and then God will bless you. So likewise, with your entire life, if you put God first, then he will bless you, not just materially, but spiritually, and in terms of um, not allowing you to be anxious. So um, in fact, for, for this uh, part, I use the New American Standard Bible because I thought the, the title there is called The Cure to Anxiety, uh, which I thought was kind of a fitting title. So um, I'll introduce it, though, with the first paragraph from the lesson, because I thought it was well said. Um, it was said of Jesus that the common people heard him gladly. Most of the people and the large crowds who followed and listened to Jesus were members of this class, the common people. They were the ones who were fed on the mountainside, who heard the Sermon on the Mountain. Jesus said to them basically, I know you're concerned about providing for your families. You worry about the food and drink that you will uh, need daily and the clothing that you need for warmth and protection. But here's what I propose. And, and now I'm going to read from um, Matthew 6, 25 to 33 from the New American Standard Bible, 90, 1995. And it's called The Cure to Anxiety. For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not the life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth more, much more than they? And who of you, by uh, being worried, can add a single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe the lilies of the field uh, um, and how they grow. They do not toil or spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But... If God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow will be thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Do not worry then, saying, What shall we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, for your heavenly Father knows that you need these things, but seek first his kingdom and righteousness, and these things shall be added unto you. So do Amen. not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough of its own trouble. Um, so the question they ask here is, what was the promise and what were the people to do in order to receive this promise? So God's basically saying, hey, look, I know most people spend their time worried about the common things that you need, but God already knows these things. So instead... Um, focus your mind on me and on God and these things shall be just given to you and you won't have to worry. Um, and I think that brings me to the second verse here which is a quote from Isaiah 26, 3 which says, 
thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. So I think that perfect peace is something to highlight. And I think it reminded me a little bit of the story of uh, the storm when the disciples are in the boat and they're trying to bail out the water and they think they're going to sink. Uh, Jesus is sleeping. Jesus is sleeping. So, so the point was that Jesus was able to be in perfect peace right. in the midst of a storm. And that was not because he was the ruler of heaven and earth because he said he had laid that aside. Right. But because he knew that God was watching over him. Amen. Um, so I, I guess I was, that makes me emotional to think God watches over us as much as he did over Jesus. Oh, yeah. But then I think First John 1, 9 also brings us hope, too, because it's like, well, do we really deserve all his good things because we're really kind of not measuring up to Jesus very well? Uh, but First John 1, 9 gives us hope. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cl cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So... I think this this gives us all hope because I think none of us can claim as Jesus did that um, I've always kept all of God's commandments perfectly and I've never done anything wrong my whole life. Therefore, I deserve God's favor. Uh, I, I don't think any of us can say that well, truly. But luckily, we have someone who has. <laughs> true, true. So So that's why I think all we have to do is to acknowledge him, to acknowledge Jesus, and to ask him to forgive us. Um, and then the second Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear them from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. I think this came out of Solomon's prayer of the dedication of the temple because he had prayed that if the people go astray and then they pray uh, and humble themselves in front of the temple, that God will hear and forgive them. Um, so I also wanted to, uh, to read from um, Desire of Ages. There's a good, good quote in here. It says, All who have chosen God's service are to rest in his care. Christ pointed to the birds flying in the heaven, to the flowers of the field and the blade, uh, and bade his hearers to consider these objects of God's creation. Are ye not uh, of much more value than they? They measure The measure of divine attention bestowed on any object is proportionate to its rank in the scale of being. The little brown sparrow is watched over by providence. The flowers of the field the grass and the, uh, that carpets the earth share the notice of our Heavenly Father. The great master artist uh, has taken thoughts for the lilies uh, and is making them so beautiful that they outshine the glory of Solomon. How much more does he care for man who is in his image and in the image and glory of God? He longs to see his children reveal a character after his similitude as the sunbeam imparts to the flowers the varied and delicate tints, so does God impart to the soul the beauty of his own character. Um, and I think this is especially comforting to us um, about the time of the end. It, it knows that men's hearts will fail in them for fear because of all the calamities that are to befall us. But I think these promises they didn't expire, unlike right. uh, the product you buy at the supermarket that says will expire on such and such a date or the pharmaceutical products that have an expiration date. God promise has no, no expiration date, so it applies to our time as well. So well, with that, we'll move on to... And God is actually the one who carries us through anyway. If we stood on our own, we'd never last. True. Do you have any final comments? Um, Actually, there was one more beautiful quote in here, uh, and I'll, I'll end with this beautiful quote. Be not therefore anxious for tomorrow. We are to follow Christ day by day. 
God does not bestow help for tomorrow. He does not give his children all the directions for their life journey at once, lest they should become confused. He tells them just as much as they can remember to perform. The strength and wisdom imparted for the present, uh, for the present emergency. If any lack wisdom for today, let him ask God that giveth to all liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. There Thank we go. you. That was my final thought. Daniel, your final thoughts? The Apostle Paul comes to mind uh, as I'm thinking of the final thoughts. I mean, if you look at his life, he was initially lost. Uh, and we know that he was standing there when the Christians were being martyred and so on and so forth. And then God reached out to him with a miraculous uh, encounter on the way to Damascus. And in that miraculous encounter, his life was turned around. I mean, he was quite educated. We know that he was at the Sanhedrin. He was to become a ruler. He understands this concept very well. When we think of the word contract, it's just a cold word to us nowadays. It's just like, hmm, contract. It's just not, God doesn't come into view when we say the word contract. But the reason God used the word covenant and contract which really means contract to us, is so that he would tell us his absolute commitment is to that level. It's not taken lightly, and it does, it's a relationship bind, binder between him and us. It is a mutually agreed upon. It is conditional about, upon our agreement. It is achievable because he provides the power to achieve it. And at the Amen. end of the day, regardless of what our past was, because the Apostle Paul, uh, Paul had a past, and we have a past, but we can say along with him, because of this covenant agreement, we can say, as he says in 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8, as his life is coming towards the end, he knows that's not much time left. And he can say, for I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Has he kept it perfectly? No. He took the Lord's hand, and he kept the Lord's hand continually and perfectly with the Lord's help. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous just, will give me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Amen. I have one final thought, actually from Friday's lesson. Whenever God's people in any period of the world have cheerfully and willfully, willingly carried out his plan in systematic benevolence, tithing, and in gifts and offerings, they have realized the standing promise that prosperity should attend all their labors just in the proportion as they obeyed his requirements. When they acknowledged the claims of God and complied with his requirements, honoring him with their substance, their barns were filled with plenty. But when they robbed God in tithes and in offerings, they were made to realize that they were not only robbing him, but themselves. For he limited his blessings to them just in proportion as they limited their offerings to him. And that's Ellen White Testimonies of the Church. Let's take this one step farther. Do we spend time with God? Do we know him? Does God have that relationship with us that he wants? But maybe we refuse to provide. Something to think about. Do we hold up to our part of the covenant? And it's not just money. Do we surrender our hearts to the Lord? Do we love Him with all of our heart and soul? That's really something that we have to look at. Because you look at it, money is one thing. I'm still convinced time is the most valuable commodity that we have. And are we, by spending time on something other than God, shortchanging ourselves and the relationship and joy we could have in Him? Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, You 
came down from heaven to meet us where we are. Lord, and you tried to save us. And Lord, we still just missed it and missed it to the point to where you sent your son and human flesh that he could properly tell us the character of God, the living God, and how much you love us. And we saw on the cross, Lord, the value you place on us. We are priceless. We go from nothing to the most expensive thing in the universe because of your love. Teach us, Lord, to submit to your will. Teach us, Lord, to surrender joyfully in our hearts that we might be partakers with you, that your spirit may abide in us, and that we may cling and hold fast to you, Lord. You've given us every tool to, to be saved. Help us, Lord, and teach us to surrender our wills. That, as John the Baptist said, what well, about Jesus? That John the Baptist must decrease so that he can increase. Lord, let it be the same with us. That we may decrease, Lord, so that your spirit has more and more room to fill us to the fullness you desire. That we may know the love of God and share it with others. We thank you, Lord. And we pray all this to your Father in heaven, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen, Lord. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath.